Your choice is simple. It is not between Charles A. Lindbergh and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It is between Lindbergh and war. Hi, it's Peter Sagal, normally heard on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, and this is episode two of the official podcast for the HBO miniseries, The Plot Against America, adapted from the novel by Philip Roth. I'm once again here with the show's creator and executive producer, Mr. David Simon. Hey, David. Hello. This week, of course, we are talking about part two of the six-part miniseries. So if you haven't watched it, you are getting ahead of yourself. You need to stop this right now. Watch the episode. Come back to us. Come on. We told you this last time. A quick recap of episode two. In this episode, Charles Lindbergh descends from the skies and the election proceeds, pushing the inhabitants of Summit Avenue, Newark, to their emotional limits. We also spend some time with Bess's Sister Evelyn, played by Winona Ryder, and her burgeoning romance with Rabbi Bengelsdorf, played by John Turturro. At the end of the episode, Lindbergh has been victorious in the election, and Alvin leaves to fight. All right, David, let's start by talking about Evelyn, Bess's sister. She is, of course, a character in the novel, but you do a tremendous amount to flesh out her story, her background, her needs, and her life. I hope so. We, we, we kind of had to. In some respects, the characters that are not within the novel's real POV, which is that of the 10-year-old boy, Philip, they're pretty much left to be the frame rather than the picture. Philip experiences, in some respects, the caricature of his aunt. Right. She's Uh, this flighty, unreliable ninny, almost. And and she arrives in their living room when she's at her most surreal. But in order to see the dynamic of complicity or collaboration in this brave new world of the Lindbergh administration, we needed to go with Evelyn and with Bengelsdorf yeah. and experience a little bit of the halls of power. But even before you get to Bengelsdorf, we find out where Evelyn is in life. She's right. Bess's sister. She is unmarried. She's at home looking for their ailing mother. And she has a relationship with someone who can be charitably called a Shagetz. A Shagetz, A a married guy in New York. So what I sensed as a viewer was that you were trying to situate Evelyn as someone who would have a strong motivation toward Bengelsdorf when she meets him for stability, for prestige, for a nice Jewish boy, finally, for someone even to make her mother happy. Right. There's actually that great moment of good news. He's a rabbi. I think he's Jewish. Yes. In the novel, Evelyn is Bess's younger sister. In the TV show, she is Bess's elder sister. Why did you make that change? Mostly because it makes perfect sense. What would be even more intimidating for a character like Evelyn would be the older sister and not yet married while her younger sister is already raising children. Right. And in Jewish families, I'm sure this was true in in a variety of families, but certainly in Jewish families, you wanted the kids married in order. Mm -hmm. The oldest daughter first. And uh, everyone was supposed to find husbands and everyone was supposed to make kids and everything was very domestic. The idea that the younger sister would be married with children and the older sister has been conflicted and is caring for the ailing mother and has had life pass her by, it explains a lot of Evelyn in a way that makes the character feel whole and sympathetic rather than a caricature. Yeah. In my mother's family of origin, she has a bunch of, she has four sisters yeah. and the oldest one was not yet married, Hmm. Gussie. And in order to wrangle a husband for Gussie, when in fact two of her sisters were either married or or, or engaged, a lie had to be told to a prospective husband that she was in fact the third sister. Oh my gosh, really? That's how how hierarchical it was. So the idea that um, of making that part of the stress on Evelyn's character just adds to it, the idea that her moment has passed. Right. And that would make a romance even with a 60-year-old rabbi, but a man of some great note, that much more intriguing to us. And Winona Ryder playing the role, just she picked right up on it. She caught the hunger that underlies a lot of Evelyn's choices. Right. And I I thought she did it beautifully. Yeah. I I, I understand that the scene in which she attends the Bengalsdorf's services and has no idea what's going on was true to life. Yeah, I... Winona is very proud of her Jewish heritage. She's half Jewish. Her father uh, is Jewish. And and, um, and I, I would say she's culturally Jewish. She has a lot of New York Jewish vibe to her. And she brought all of that to the table. But the one thing she doesn't have is any sense of the liturgy. She was not 
bat mitzvah. She's, she's not been through any religious training. She, it was not her upbringing. And um, we had nothing but fun sticking her in the middle of, as if she'd had to walk into a Saturday synagogue service for the first time in, in years. <laughs> The visuals of her pretending to know the words to that yeah. which she does not know the words to, yeah. or bending late, or getting up yes. late. She's a beat behind. She's I've been there. It's, oh. like, it's like a white guy trying to snap along with jazz. It's just, you're just... Yeah, you're, you're snapping on the one and the three. <laughs> exactly. So, she, yeah, I got to say, it was just, it was a delight. It was the funniest thing. At one point, all the dailies came back from that scene, and we just watched them over and over again. <laughs> because the one thing that Winona doesn't get credit for, she has an extraordinary career. She gets all the dramatic credit you could want, but... She's got great comedic chops. Yeah. She can often be very funny. There, there's so many things to talk about, but since we've talked about Evelyn, I think we need to move right to Rabbi Bengelsdorf, played by John Turturro, one of the greatest Jewish, non-Jewish actors, or is it a non-Jewish, <laughs> Jewish actors of all time. The character of Bengelsdorf might be unusual to people. He was unusual to me. I am from Russian Jews right. who were, you know, right off the boat. or were the rabble. They, right, exactly. They either came on the boat or they stayed near the dock. <laughs> but Bengelsdorf is a completely different kind of Jew. He's a, he's a German Jew. The German right. Jews came over earlier in the 19th century. Right. He's Southern. I mean, I remember reading about him in the book and thinking, no, they're Southern Jews. But yes, there Absolutely were. Absolutely there were. And he has a kind of haughtiness that is so distinct from everybody else in this miniseries. And if you spoke to any of the Jews who came here at any point in 1910, 1920, 1930 and encountered the German Jews who were already here, they would recognize that haughtiness. They would know exactly what it was. Yeah. That schism in the Jewish community is, it's replicable in other immigrant communities, but it really is first off the boat, first established. And, oh my God, look at the rabble coming behind me. Yeah. Because the German Jews were some of the most educated and assimilated Jews of Europe. And they prided themselves on being quintessential Europeans in a way that the Polish and Hungarian and, and Russian Jews, they were very much of the shtetl, yeah. much less educated. The German Jews were appalled at the levels of poverty and ignorance and crowding and poor hygiene of the later arrivals of the Eastern European. They thought, my God, they're giving us a bad name. Yeah. My grandfather, who got here in 1914, he was offered a bounty of several hundred dollars if he would get back on a boat with his cousin and go to Galveston. And that bounty was paid in part by a coalition of German Jews who were trying to get Jews to go somewhere the hell else to get away from the Lower East Side in Williamsburg, the German Jews were devotedly assimilationist. Yeah. They thought they were Germans. Speaking of assimilationist, Bengelsdorf in this episode establishes himself not only as a supporter of the presidential candidate, Charles A. Lindbergh, but he makes it possible for Lindbergh to become president. In, in Alvin's words, he koshers Lindbergh. Mm -hmm. You must have had to think about what would motivate this guy to ally himself, not just with an anti-Semite, but actually help his rise to power. Right. And I think it was necessary that he find enough running room to believe that Lindbergh is not necessarily anti-Semite, that a lot of his early statements, which could have been perceived as anti-Semitic, were in fact offered up out of a benign ignorance rather than a, a malevolence. Right. So we gave him that credibility of, of at least believing that Lindbergh could be worked with. He was for peace, he was for neutrality, but he wasn't necessarily against the Jews. Right. And that gave Bengelsdorf credibility enough to stand in the world and not be a, a complete fool. And it was possible to do that, I think, in some respects. In the classic parlance of Jewish culture, he's the court Jew. Right. He finds the degree of acceptance that he receives in the halls of power to be sufficient validation to justify his continued participation. Right. In that sense, Bengelsdorf and Evelyn become, on our spectrum, the characters most indicative of compliance and complicity, and they represent one aspect of what happens when authoritarian dynamic takes hold. What they offer in terms of personal aspiration and in potential to better one's position, and to think maybe that you're affecting things for the better, that, yeah. you, that you can work with this. The number of German cultural figures and industrialists and political figures who thought they could work with 
Hitler. Right. Get in the guy's good side. We can tell him what to and, do. He doesn't really know about a lot yeah, of stuff. He, he speaks a tough game, but you know, once he gets into power, he'll turn presidential. Yes, exactly. And also, by access to the person who now has power and presumably doesn't know how to wield it, you get a tremendous amount of power. Right. I mean, I can think of, uh, of certain senators right now oh, who yeah. have more or less said that out loud. And the question is whether or not you're going to ride that wave or you're going to be consumed by it. I mean, there, you know, for every Hitler, there's a von Papen. Yeah. I mean, John Turturro is, as everybody knows, a genius and doesn't need anybody's help to do anything. But did he ever come to you and say, like, ask for your help in justifying this guy's actions? He came ready-made with the archetype that he was going to follow, which was Rumkowski, uh, the famous king of the Jews in the Holocaust. He was the Jewish emissary from the Nazis to the ghetto. Right. You know, it, it got to the point of, I will now make the irreconcilable reconcilable to you because somebody has to. And I right. will bring the bad news. And by cooperating with the Nazis, we may be able to spare ourselves in some regard. And yeah. it, it comes down to eventually you're the guy who says, give them your youngest children to take yeah. on the boxcars because that way you'll be able to keep your older children. Yeah. Those kind of horrible rationalizations until they finally come from Romkowski, you know, right. when, once he's served his purpose. So Totoro came with Romkowski in his head. As soon as he mentioned it, I thought, king of the Jews. Right. That's who this guy thinks he is. That's the space he wishes to occupy. That's the space where he thinks he can do well for himself and do good for his people. We've been talking about Bengelsdorf, who is one kind of American Jew who is managing to find his place one way. There's another character introduced in this episode who has a different approach, and that's Steinem, the realtor, a real estate developer, uh, the racing commissioner. A macher. A macher, who Alvin in this episode is now working for as his driver. And uh, Steinem, not to put a uh, too fine a point on it, is, uh, is a putz. He is an asshole. He is a bully. He's a guy who knows how to make money. Who not only knows how to make money, but who believes that that is how he will protect himself and his power in this world. Right. Money makes money. It gets you to the deals and the properties you couldn't touch before. And the hi-hats wouldn't let you in their club or want you buying a house next to theirs. They won't like you any better. But they'll make way because they need your money to get it done. Since this takes place in a time where the safety and existence of Jews were threatened, his approach doesn't seem that unreasonable. Just acquire money and power so they can't touch you. He thinks money does answer anything in America. We are a society that considers profit to be the ultimate metric. He's not wrong. On the other hand, he senses all the slights that are there for him because he's a Jew. Yeah. And I think this is true now for our immigrant groups today. You're now looking at that moment for Latinos in this country where they've acquired enough status. For example, Cubans yeah. in Miami who tend to gravitate towards more conservative politics. And the question is, are they in or are they out? You know, you look at the immigration rhetoric about Latinos coming from this administration, and where do you stand if you're already in through the door, if yeah. you're already established? Where do you stand and where's your, where's your loyalty to, yeah. to those not yet in? I mean, the bravest thing about Roth, Roth was unimpressed with anybody who wanted to walk away from any of the ugly stereotypes of anything. Like, don't give them that character because right. it's a stereotype. My grandfather, I, I read a letter he wrote many, many years ago in the 30s where he talked about the need for Jews to be twice as good and as virtuous right. so as to demonstrate to the world that these stereotypes right. were not true. It's why, it's why there was so much hostility within the Jewish community in the early years of Roth's career, which yeah. he's telling too much truth about the ugly parts of, of, of things. But I understood the impulse, and I, I could remember my own grandmother. Whenever the some Jewish guy got in trouble, right? You know, some Jewish guys. Uh, what a, what did a they get? Shanda for a the Goyim. Shanda for the Goyim. Roth never thought in his mind about what he was delivering to the Goyim yeah. or, or to you know, to non-Jews or to or to Jews. It was like I'm writing life. I'm writing life, and and so right there in the middle of his book, while he's writing a book that is basically about Jewish American identity and the right to stand your place as a Jew. I mean, you know, it's a very deliberate treatise against anti-Semitism as a whole. He's nonetheless willing to drop Abe Steinem right in the middle of the book and say, hey, and there's this guy too. Yeah. The episode begins with the arrival of Lindbergh by air. He appears, you see a glimpse of his face, his plane. First time you see Lindbergh in the yeah. piece. Yeah. I mean, you, you as, as a flesh and blood human. He's only been a voice on the radio, somebody that people talk about, and he, he descends from the heavens 
Yeah, and, and he, he strides on the scene and he says the 42 words right. that are his standard stump speech. You yes. either vote for me in peace or you vote for Roosevelt in war. Right. Makes it, makes it as simple as that. There's this sense of almost like this mythic figure who has an emotional resonance with people that is much different than the more nitty-gritty politics. I promise you this and I promise you that right. and I will express this. Does that make sense to you? Do you think that a man like that with an approach like that could be as successful as he I, was? I think this scenario by Roth is more credible than the one we experienced in 2016. And Roth said so to me, and this was the other thing he cautioned me about when I met him. He said, don't mistake Donald Trump for Charles Lindbergh. The similarities are somebody who's an outsider to the political sphere, who arrives on the scene, who uses the most demagogic and basic appeals to fear to convince you that he has your interests at heart when nothing else registers from other politicians or, for, or from the system as a whole, that he's outside of that which no longer makes you happy and he promises change whatever that is. He will deliver what you haven't had yet, right. wh whatever that may be, and he will do it at the expense of your enemies who are his enemies. He says that's all the same. What isn't the same and what you can never confuse is that Lindbergh was a hero. He was bathed in greatness yeah. from the moment he took that flight and landed in Paris. There was something about him, and he had personal magnetism and charm. And he said, that's the scary part, is that America took this lurching turn towards demagoguery and towards authoritarian principles without the necessary hero. All we needed was the guy venting. Yeah. We, we, we did it with a guy who was just an angry guy, as opposed to the guy who has demonstrably achieved in the most dramatic ways, and now is an angry guy. Right. What's interesting is, uh, my understanding is that Lindbergh maintained this extraordinary reputation even as he sunk into anti-Semitism, but it ended with World War II, with Pearl Harbor. All of a sudden, the isolationists were discredited. He was intellectually discredited once we were in World War II, and he realized it right away. And because he was a brave man, he, although he had resigned his commission, I think, as an, as an army officer under Roosevelt, he immediately tried to re-enlist. He offered his services. Roosevelt wisely, in reality, took him up on that and said, you'll be sort of like an inspector general to come up with like good ideas to advance our aviation. Yeah. Sent him not to Europe, but to the Pacific right. uh, to help with the war against the Japanese and told the military, don't let him see combat. Let him help, but not too much. Right. And because he was a brave man, he, he actually very quietly talked his way into combat missions. He ended up shooting down a bunch of Japanese planes, which got no publicity. It was not. It was embargoed during the war because Roosevelt was not going to let that out of the bag Right. because he, he, so, he was so wary of, of Lindbergh. But yeah, I mean, Lindbergh was very different, very different. Let's catch up with the other characters, the other members of the Levin family. Bess gets a job, which is nice for Bess. It's something that married women didn't ordinarily do, particularly in the Jewish community. You know, the, the, the homemakers were revered. And so she's stepping out of that. She's trying to advantage them in a very basic way, which is an extra income. Right. You get the sense that Roth adored his mother. Right. For being sort of the center of the family, the, the core of, of the family ethos. And while he may have admired his father's work ethic or his father's um, stoicism in some ways, the emotional core of the family, the place where he looked to for emotional wisdom was to his mother. Here's Zoe Kazan. She's talking about how she wanted to play the role of Bess Levin a little differently than Philip Roth had written her. There's a kind of idealized woman, I think, in the novel. I think Philip Roth felt a kind of idealization of his mother. You can see it in his other autobiographical books. He's much more critical of his father, and he sort of canonizes his mother. And one thing that was really important to me was that she feel like a real person, that she feel like flesh and blood. And, you know, I think we as a culture like to canonize mothers. We like to think of motherhood as being this kind of holy mantle. And I really wanted to feel how that responsibility and desire to be a really good mother and a good wife also creates a lot of like kind of anxiety and emotion in her because there's only so much she can do to protect her family. So I think that this idea of Bess being kind of the conscience or being like um, the moral center of the family is true, but I think it's more about her trying to keep them safe and keep them whole and keep them all together and less about her having a kind of like higher purpose or higher calling. 
So Zoe does play Bess as a much more complicated character than she seems to be in the novel, not just with respect to sort of morality and motherly love, but also in terms of her sophistication about politics. Bess is a political creature in a way that Herman is not. He's the guy reading the newspaper every day. She's the person who actually wields real politic within the family in a quiet and deeply influential way that is often much more subtle than what her husband is throwing out there. Her mm-hmm. husband has one gear. He, you know, he has one gear in its overdrive when it comes to his own frustrations and his own political opinions. There's like a constant fire behind his eyes that sometimes seems scary. And we'll see where that brings him later. One of my favorite scenes, maybe in the whole series, is where Herman and Bess reenact a Gracie Allen bit. I love that. Mom, do Gracie. Not right now, honey. I, I can't. Just go upstairs. Go to sleep. It's really late. Come on, please. Just do a little bit. Philip asks for normalcy. Yeah. He says, Ma, do Gracie. And you get the impression that, like, in happier times, they would gather on the radio and they would learn a bit and, and they would perform. That scene brings us back to the fact that this is a family and it's a fairly healthy family. If politics would just leave this family alone, yeah. they'd be fine. When speaking of politics, of course, we also have Sandy, the artistic yeah. son who kept his sketch of Lindbergh. He's far more sympathetic to Lindbergh than anybody else. He goes out to see Lindbergh. He sneaks away. Yeah. What's going on with him in your view? There's a natural rebellion that he is, for the first time, trying to think on his own, independent of his father. And that's a pretty 15-year-old dynamic by necessity to find your own way into an argument. I can remember the first time I got in an argument with my father and two of my uncles, political argument. I was about that age. I was able to hold my own on a few points. And, and um, I remember my, my uncle Hank turning to my father at one point and going, who knew the little pisser had a brain? <laughs> and it was like maybe the most proud moment of my life to that point. My uncle Hank thought I could actually argue something. So there's a little of that going on. But the other thing is he is susceptible to the hero's journey, to the great man theory of history, which is very, very seductive. And again, a lot of Jewish boys went through that with Lindbergh, which was, he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. You know, we're all dancing the Lindy Hop um, because they they named the dance after him because, you know, who, who else would you? And then suddenly his politics veers away from what your, your parents say is good. And so he's a little bit tormented by that. Yeah. If, if your hero is disparaging Jews, there's a couple of reactions. We see a lot of them. We see Herman's reaction. Another reaction might be to put aside your Jewishness. He's trying to make a place for himself that is not necessarily not Jewish, but not your kind of Jewish. Right. And, and I'll be able to stand in the light of Lindbergh and be fine. Right. This obviously builds up to election night. There's the rally at, at Madison Square Garden, is it supposed yeah. to be? for? Yeah, I wasn't quite clear. Was it at the Republican National Convention or was it at a, a different kind of rally? We were doing the Republican National Convention, but we were purposely echoing the 1940s America First rally, the, yeah. fa- the famous ones involving the Bund and, yeah. and Fritz Kuhn. We, we used the same artistic motifs, the Washington, the, the banners, the militaristic drum corps. We very consciously copied a lot of the um, iconography of the famous America First rallies at Madison Square Garden in 1940, the ones that are so historically relevant. And we grafted it onto the Republican National Convention that didn't happen. It wasn't nominating a right. America you know, first. I, I, I think we should say, uh, just out of kindness to Republicans, that the actual 1940 National Convention was nothing like that. They right. nominated a newcomer to politics named Wendell Wilkie on right. like the 8th or 20th ballot in the middle of the night, and he went on to get creamed by FDR. Right. This sort of Nazi-like rally in Madison Square Garden, though, it's based on a real thing that happened in Madison Square Garden just before the war. There were some famous incidents that came out. You know, there was a there was a Jewish kid from Brooklyn who decided to walk up on the stage and deliver a protest, and he was beaten within an inch of his life. It's sort of a famous yeah. interaction. There's a, some other subtext behind it, which is that a lot of the Jewish gangsters from East New York, a lot of the, the Murder Incorporated guys, yeah. um, went downtown and waited for the rally to end, and then followed some of the Bun guys into the into the alleys and into the streets, and there were fights all over. Mid, it's know, like it, a version of what happened at the end of part one. Exactly. It was interesting to me that you had the scene shot. You didn't see the whole sweep of the audience at first. You didn't see the sweep of the hall. You saw Rabbi Bengelsdorf backstage. Where is he? What's he doing? He's obviously, I think they come in and they say, they're ready for you. And he comes out onto that grand stage and stands in front of that crowd. I want Charles Lindbergh 
to be my president, not in spite of my being a Jew, but because I am a Jew, an American Jew. I don't want to invoke too many stage directions, but there's a really interesting one. You say, Bengelsdorf now changes the world, as if that speech, that koshering of Lindbergh, is what changes everything. And, and as Alvin explains, he's not talking to the Jews. Does that idiot think one single Jew is going to go out and vote for this anti-Semite because of that stupid lying speech? I mean, what does he think he's doing? Koshering Lindbergh. Koshering what? They didn't get him up there to talk to Jews. They didn't buy him off for that. Don't you understand? He's up there talking to the Goyim. He's given all the good Christian folks of this country their personal rabbi's permission to vote for Lindy and, and, and not to think themselves Nazis or, or, or anti-Semites. Can't you see what they just got the great Lionel Bengelsdorf to do? Most Jews are not going to be fooled by the, the court Jew. Right. It's to tell the Gentiles who don't want to be anti-Semitic but really want to support Lindbergh. Right. Or they don't want to tell themselves they want to be anti-Semitic or they don't want to be against the Jews per se. It's okay. Look, here's a, here's a prominent Jew who's saying it's okay to support this guy. Right. And that dynamic... We witnessed it in 2016. I was amazed when I read that scene in the book how extraordinarily prescient it was right. that someone who's, to be polite about it, xenophobic, would have a member of the hated group come up and say, no, no, he's totally fine. Right. Ben Carson exactly. gave a speech where he said, Donald Trump isn't a racist. Why? The valet parkers and the dishwashers at his clubs just love him. Right. You need to be taken off the hook for supporting something ugly by having somebody who is the ostensible target cooperate. Right. And he walks out and takes Bengelsdorf's hand and he holds it up for the still photography. Look, I Here, have a Jew. Here's my Jew. He here's loves my me. Jew. The Jew loves me. Lindbergh didn't run for the presidency. If he had, do you think that there was enough of a nativist, isolationist, yes. racist faction in this country that it there were, a lot of people, there were a lot of people who genuinely didn't want to be in a, in to, in a European war in any circumstances. Yeah. And they were good people. Uh, they were people who thought, this is not our fight. Yeah. There's an ocean between us and them. It's a retread of World War I. Hitler's no worse than the Kaiser. Right. You know, uh, Look what happened there. Right. The fact is the country was mostly isolationist in 1940. And what they were worried about the Roosevelt administration drifting into that war. And Lindbergh was a classic hero. And he was speaking a very populous sensibility. And I think at some point we even cite some of the Roper poll numbers on what people thought about Jewish Americans, whether they were really Americans, whether or not they you know, were deserving of first class citizenship. And it is a moment in its time where he could have won. The other thing is Roosevelt was asking for a third term. It wasn't yet unconstitutional, but Washington had refused it. Classically, you know, at the end of his second term, Washington said, no, 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 there's no permanent ruling elite here. You know, we, we, we passed this thing around. So Roosevelt was asking for something that hadn't been granted before. It's a question for history, but it's not. In, you know, there's a reason Roosevelt was worried about Lindbergh. Yeah. The episode ends election night 1940. I am going to guess that that came out of some recent experience, the sense of impending crisis of impending doom. We can't call Pennsylvania. We can't call Ohio. We can't call Florida. Right. What? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you can't call? Yeah. That was a transformational moment for America. This was true in the book. It was true in the television scene. It was true in real life, which is the primary emotion is disbelief. This cannot be happening. And yet you're watching it happening. Right. I think you captured that extraordinarily well, just in... in, from, in especially from Herman's point right. of view, who, who so was convinced of Roosevelt's professionalism and, and capacities as a candidate and as a politician. Right. In the book, it's a landslide. Yeah. And obviously, we didn't experience that in 2016, but the emotions are the same. The, right. the emotions are the same. When, when all is said and done and when it's called, it feels as if you've been completely undone by, yeah. by your expectations. Yeah. Herman's reaction is shock and horror and disbelief, Alvin gets on a train and leaves and goes to fight. And that seems to me at that moment heroic or, or at least brave. Was there any sense in your mind of like contrasting Herman and Alvin and what they decided to do 
is it just like that's what their characters would do? Alvin's Alvin's a fighter. Alvin and they're does... at a different point in life. One yeah. of them is a, has a wife and two kids, right? And he's all he's in his thirties, and the other one is younger, and his capacity for risk and adventure is is greater. To be fair to Herman, but yes, there is a moment of you will sit by the radio and rant, yeah, and you may even actually stand up on your hind legs and speak in public about what's right or wrong in your country. But I'm going to go put a gun in my hand. Right. That's that John Brown moment of yeah. what would we do if confronted with slavery? What would we be willing to do in 1860? Would we be there at Harper's Ferry or would we be standing by and going, well, I hope they figure this out because I got to be at work in an hour. Yeah. That's the best part of this novel, which is what would you do? What do you do if you're watching the Reichstag burn in Germany and you're, and you're watching your fragile republic come undone? Would you stand up and take the beating? The, the best guy I've read speaking to this was Camus, who makes the argument to commit even to a losing cause, you know, where you're very unlikely to win if it's a just cause, is absurd. You're going to impale yourself. You're going to ruin your life. The people around you are going to be damaged. But to not commit is also absurd. Yeah. To, to stand by as a human being is also absurd. Only one offers a chance for dignity. And he's, so he's making the argument for dignity. It's like you may lose, but you're not, it doesn't absolve you of fighting. And all of these characters, Bengelsdorf with his complicity and, and Evelyn trailing behind him and Bess caught in the middle and Alvin with a gun in his hand and Herman just being willing to speak his mind at any cost, they're all on the spectrum. That's the power of this book is it basically speaks to us in this moment of 2020 of where were you when this happened in your country? Where were you when it got to this point? Right. Uh, it is absolutely true that we all imagine, maybe we imagined at this point, that when the moment of crisis come, we would all be Alvin because we fancy that we would be heroes. But in truth, one of the things I think we've all found out in life is that it turns out that being a hero requires sacrifice. It costs a lot. And I think sometimes when we wonder, why don't they just quit their jobs? Or why don't they come out and just testify against them? You know, it's because they'll lose a lot. It's why I've always been unequivocal on First Amendment issues. It's not there for that easy dissent that is polite and makes everybody comfortable. Yeah. It's there because it costs enough to say the unpopular thing, even if you have a legal right. If you're going against the wave of society and saying the unpopular thing that might be ahead of its time, yeah. the last thing you should have is to be legally vulnerable. Right. It seems like freedom of speech is rock solid. It seems like all these things are rock solid. All our institutions are rock yeah. solid. It seems like the Senate should be able to be the U.S. Senate. It seems like everything seems like it's a plausible institution. Yeah. Democracy is very, very fragile. Yeah. And, and we don't quite realize it because it's been around for our lifetimes. But on, on the grand scale of human endeavor, it's still an experiment. Yeah. I think one of the reasons it's so fragile is it depends more on heroism than we might think, and heroism is hard to come by. On my blog site, I have a picture of 10 of the 11 members of my family who couldn't get out of Europe, and were either shot dead in, in a Belarusian forest or, or, or went to Auschwitz. And I have the pictures, you know, kids, yeah. wives, husbands. I know their names. And... They couldn't get out. No country wanted to take them. Including, we should point out, as we talk about the alternative versus the real history of the United States, because the United States wouldn't take them. Right. We, we all know the story, at least we Jews know the story of the St. Louis. Yes, right. We, we had a, we, there was a quota of, there was a tight quota on, against immigration from 1924 on. Yeah. And we didn't relax it. Even when the gates were closing on these people. I put their pictures up. It was the moment where... They were talking about taking Syrian refugees in this country. And the sheer weight of people who were like, I don't know, the Syrians, they're, you, know, you yeah. know they're Muslims. Yeah. You know they're Muslims. You know, you might get some terrorists in there. How are you going to screen them properly? You know, and like, I heard this, and I heard this with the ears of some like, I'm sorry, bring me every Syrian you can, because I'm still looking at the faces of the people who are my kin and knowing that they were trapped. And I even heard it from some Jews, like, you know, you know, they're, you know, they're Oh, God, Muslims. yeah. It's unbelievable how fast human beings will change their coats if they feel like they're not incentivized. They're not personally incentivized to care. Right. And it's terrifying to me because if any people should be sensitized to the immigrant, it's the wandering Jews who, for lack of a home, yeah. horrible things happen. One more note about election night. Frank Sinatra, we get to hear. Ghosts of a chance. Yeah. And why did you put him in there? 
Jersey boy. Yeah. Jersey boy. Much mm. beloved. But also, Ghost of a Chance is a beautiful ballad yeah. that speaks to the election. I'm one of those guys who wants the song to gracefully edge up to the message, but yeah. never be the complete message. Yeah. It leaves no room for the picture if the lyrics are yeah. dead on. And Ghost of a Chance worked beautifully. It's actually from 44, I think, that version. So it's a little bit of an anachronism, but close enough. Who's going to know? <laughs> We've reached the end of part two of The Plot Against America. Charles A. Lindbergh is now the president of the United States. The Levin family is, shall we say, troubled by this and anticipating hard times to come. We will find out how correct they are in part three. Thanks again to David Simon for spending his time with us and talking about his work. We'll be back next week with another deep dive into episode three of The Plot Against America. That will air next Monday, 9 p.m. Eastern on HBO. I am Peter Sagal. You can hear me in the meantime on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. This podcast was produced by HBO in conjunction with Pineapple Street Studios. Our team at Pineapple Street Studios includes executive producers Jenna Weiss-Berman, Max Linsky, and Barry Finkel. This episode's lead producer is Emmanuel Hapsis. Our associate producer is Alexis Moore, post-producing and mixing by Elliot Adler. And our editor is Maddie Sprung-Kaiser. You can listen to this podcast review and rate it via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, the various HBO apps that are proliferating everywhere and anywhere else you might find your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.